Okay, well, I, I parried quite a bit uh, from Matthew uh, this week, and uh, I believe the Lord changed my mind last night and this morning. Just uh, something I've been meditating on myself, something I've been preaching in the open air, and I just want to uh, have us think about these things this morning. And, uh, so let's go to Ephesians chapter 5, and verse 15. <coughs> Brother Kevin, me and Brother Kevin talk about things, elders of the body, but it did, and the Lord's always got us on the same exact path. Mm-hmm. And uh, he'll say things to me that the Lord's already speaking to me, and, and we'll just correlate with them. And you know, it's like we don't really need to talk, we can just let the Lord lead us, and it'll be fine. Um, but in regards to the songs this, this morning, uh, as we go through, I'm going to use some lyrics from the song, because you all just sang these with your mouth. And I want you to examine yourself. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 15. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So, see that you walk circumspectly. Circumspectly, the Greek word there means carefully, it means well. It means pay attention to. Now, oftentimes I preach this scripture in the open air. I know I did quite a bit uh, this week uh, because there's lots of people who are at the Super Bowl who drove hundreds of miles, flew hundreds of miles, spent hundreds of dollars, thousands of dollars to come to a party and get drunk and idolize sports stars, which I think is not welcome circumspectly. It's not redeeming the time. Uh, But as me and Brother Kevin talked recently, he reminded me of a saying that I, I... held to a long time ago, still hold to, and I think it was actually Ravenhill who said this, maybe I'm wrong about this, but sometimes the good things become the enemy of the best. Sometimes the good things become the enemy of the best. Good things can take away from the best things. And so we need to make sure we're walking <coughs> carefully. We need to pay attention to the time. Just think about your life for a second. If, if there's days that go by I'm talking about days when you're doing the Lord's work, but there's days that go by when you're just doing things that isn't going to build God's kingdom, that isn't for the edification of your wife, your family, your husband, isn't for the edification of the saints or for the, the salvation of souls, and time just seems to fly by, and you've lost track of time. It's a sure sign you're not walking carefully. That so you're not walking circumspectly. The time just passing you by. It's almost like this scripture saying, look at the time. Use each minute carefully, because it's got, it's gonna fly by, friends. It's gonna go by, and then we we'll have to stand before God. I, I don't want to stand before God and have my my wife or children say, "Well, he should have been doing this with us or that with us, and then he was doing this instead." I, I don't want my son to come with me and say, "Daddy, I asked you to play with me, but you're on Facebook instead." You know, whatever it may be, I'm just giving that throwing that out there as an example. But whatever it may be, I don't want my children to come to me. You know, I work from home. I'm a graphic designer. I want them to come to me and say, Daddy, you were too busy working. You didn't spend time with me. I don't want Jesus to say to me, you didn't keep your eyes on me. You were too busy doing this, that, this, and that, which aren't necessarily sinful things, but they distracted you from me, the most important thing, from doing my work. And I, I, I don't ever want him to say that about me. And so we need to walk carefully, not as fools, but as the wise. Circumspectly, carefully, and it says redeeming the time. And that's the same word that used about Jesus Christ. Redeeming us from every lost deed. Delivering us from every lawless deed. Redeeming us. Separating us from it. And so we, we need to redeem the time. And when, we, when we're sinners, we didn't redeem the time. The time just controlled us. But the question I have for you, is, is time controlling you? Or are you controlling the time? Are you redeeming the time? Are you using it properly? Are you delivering the time from foolish things? Not necessarily sinful things to do them, but foolish things that aren't going to matter in light of eternity. Are you walking circumspectly? Are you redeeming the time? The days are evil, friends. And we've talked about this verse many times from Matthew 24, that the lawlessness will abound in the last days, and the love of many will grow cold. The love of most will grow cold. 
And don't let your love grow cold because you're not seeking Him. You're not keeping your eyes on Him like we just sung about. You're not keeping your eyes on Him. Not having it be all about Him. You know, words have no value unless the heart backs it up. Keeping it as a lover of your soul. Is it about His fame or is it about your fame? You know, you, you, you have, I want this pure and holy passion to to know and follow hard after you. But as we walk through this life, if, if we're not walking circumspectly, carefully, if we're not redeeming the time, but letting the time control us, then we're just strolling about. Are we running after Jesus? Or are we walking and crawling after Jesus? There's so many distractions, friends. So many distractions in this world that would seek to distract you from the most important, the most excellent things. It's evil around us. And one of the devil's greatest tools is distraction. He would love to distract you from what you're really supposed to be about. And that's about him. And about your family. And about your wife or your husband. You know, I, I think sometimes we get caught up in this cyber world. And the real people who need us, who want us, are right there in front of us. And this is cyber world, and I, I'm not saying you can't have real friends on on internet, or you can't have uh, real fellowship with people like that. But that that's not really the way God designed it, friends. And, and 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 the real people are right here in front of us, and we need to walk carefully, circ- not getting distracted. Because I don't want to stand before Christ and have Him say, "Kerrigan, you could have memorized a thousand scriptures, but you were too busy doing this, that, this, and that instead." I'm sure you don't want Him to say that about you either, friends. What are you doing that's not really the most excellent thing? That you could replace with the most excellent thing. So that you can walk more carefully. So that you can actually redeem the time and control your time under God's uh, authority, under God's direction, instead of having your time control you. So we must, you know, as I preach these things to the lost, I want to preach them to myself. And maybe they're going, you know, I would never do a lot of things they're doing, of course. I would never spend hundreds of dollars and, and go drive hundreds of miles and to, for a football game, unless I'm going to preach to them, of course. But, but there's, there's other things, friends, and we just need to really examine ourselves, make sure we're walking circumspectly, carefully, paying attention to the time, lest it drift by us. Right by. I said, what did I do with all my years? You know, me and John were talking about this the other day, you know, how our children are growing up. And I used to remember every time we'd go see my family, I'd see my mom's family twice a year, and they say, oh, you're getting so big, Kerrigan. You're, you're growing up. You're getting tall. You're, you're getting strong. You're, you're getting smarter. And, and the fact of the matter is they're right. I thought it was annoying at the time. But they're right, and our children are growing up. Are, are you giving them the time and attention they need? Are you giving them the time and attention they need? Starting right now. Don't, don't wait till they're out of the house and you think, well, where did time go? Make it count, friends. You know, a, a long time ago, uh, uh, I heard someone, a preacher say that he counted how many weeks he would have left from right then until his, he turned 75, 80 years old. And he would remove a penny out of this jar for each week, you know, 52 weeks of the year. And he would remove a penny each time, and he would see his life. Dwindle. So you have a visual picture of his life passing away to remind him it's going, and, and you can even take two jars and have this one empty and this one. Oh, I'm halfway there now. I'm three quarters of the way there. It's passing away. I got a couple pennies left. Oh, God's accepted my life. Praise God. But, friends, life is passing away. What are you doing with it? Even for the young ones who understand this. What, what you know, according to some people I know who do Bible chronology, you might only have 25 years left. You might not reach 75 years old. You might not reach 80 years old. You may, you may barely reach 30. What are you doing with your life? You're not going to have the opportunity we have to look back and man, I wasted my youth. Now I need to do something with my life. Don't wait until then. Do something about it now. Because the days are evil. And as we walk wisely instead of unwisely, redeeming the time, walking carefully, looking at the time, paying attention to the time, then we will know what the will of the Lord is. Because we're seeking Him. Because as we seek Him, He's not going to allow As we're seeking Him and submitting to Him, we're not going to lose our track of time. We're not going to let time control us. We're going to redeem the time. 
will be, as Romans 12 says, a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Being able to know His perfect will for us. It's great to walk in the revealed will of God you find in the Scriptures. But God has a perfect will for you, for each one of you, to walk in, and you will not know it just by reading the Bible, friends. You will know it by getting on your knees, getting on your face before God, crying out to Him, and Him revealing it to you. If you're not doing that, you're not redeeming the time. If you're not doing that, you're not walking carefully. You will not know what the perfect will of God is, and you are not walking wisely. In the Old Testament, a sacrifice was dead. It could not remove itself from the altar. It couldn't go anywhere. But as living sacrifices, guess what? We can remove ourselves from the altar of God and say, God, okay, I've, I've done what you want me to do for a little while. I'm going to do what I want to do for a little while now. I'm not talking about going out and getting drunk or fornicating or becoming a homosexual. I'm talking about wasting time. That's what I'm talking about. And God forbid we waste... If we are the last generation, friends... We even have more responsibility and more accountability to not waste our time. To preach to as many as possible. To pray as much and hard as we can. To love God and worship Him with our whole heart. Instead of thinking it's no big deal to sing a song to Jesus. And fool around with the people around us. And joke around about singing to Jesus. But giving Him our all. Keeping our eyes on Him. Running after Him. Not walking. Not getting distracted by all the things along the road. You know, we have our narrow path, Ron. The wide path right over here. It's not too far away. It's not too far away. And all the stuff in between, the fringes of the, of the narrow path, well, that looks pretty. Oh, yeah, I'm going to play with that a little bit. No, we need to run. We need to fix our eyes on Jesus. The author and perfecter of our faith. And run after Him hard. If we're not, we're not walking wisely. You know, James 4 and verse 14. I preach this all the time in the open air. For what is your life? It's even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Your life's a vapor, friends. My life's a vapor. It's going to vanish away. And in context, this is talking about someone who says, today, tomorrow, I'll go here, I'll do this, I'll do that, and... You know, but I tell you what, it could apply to someone who says, well, you know what, I'll, I'll, I'll memorize that verse tomorrow. I'll, I'll get my prayer life straight tomorrow. I'll, I'll pray more tomorrow. No, what about right now? What about today? Putting it off is just as bad as someone who says what they're saying here in James. Presuming you have the time. Presuming you have tomorrow when you don't. First Peter, chapter one, and starting in verse seventeen. It said, "If you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, if that's if that's that's truly who God is, isn't He? He judges impartially, according to each one's work." Well, if you believe that, you should conduct yourself throughout your time of your stay here in fear. Why? Well, why should I conduct my time? Well, because he's going to judge partially without, without any kind of partiality. And he's going to judge according to your work. He said, knowing that you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from, the, from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers. That you are rescued <coughs> from these things. But with the precious blood of Christ. As of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So we have this precious blood. There's two reasons why we should conduct our, our lives throughout the time of our stay here. Because we're sojourners here, we're aliens here, we're strangers here, it's not our home place. There's two reasons why we should walk and conduct our stay here in fear. It's because God will judge us without partiality. Number one. He's going to judge you without partiality. We all have 24 hours in a day, friends. People who memorize more verses, who preach more, who pray more, who lead their families properly, who disciple their children properly, who love their spouse properly, they have the same amount of time you do. 24 hours in a day. And God's not going to say, well, you know, you had this and that and this and that. No, He's going to judge you impartially. 
And two, because you were bought with the precious blood of Christ. And that precious blood of Christ should should implore you, should move you, should in that direction to redeeming the time, to walking more carefully. You weren't bought with the blood of goats and lambs. You were bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And our life should be lived in light of that. No more wasting time, friends. No more wasting time. Work, work has. There's time for work, but there's not. You're going to lose time with your children. There, there's time to do these other things, but there's. You're going to lose time in prayer. You can't gain it back. You can't gain. I, I can't gain back yesterday. I can't gain back five years ago. But I can look upon it and examine it and say, you know what? I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to walk circumspectly. I'm not going to let my children's life pass right by and not disciple them properly. I'm not going to let my, my marriage pass on by and not spend the proper time with my wife. I'm not going to let my life pass by and stand before the one to whom I must give an account and say, Lord, I didn't have a relationship with you on earth. I didn't pray to you. My little prayers at dinner time, my prayers for my family in the morning, oh, that was good enough, Lord. Well, the, the prayers on Sunday, I pray a lot then, but you know, the rest of the week I pray a couple minutes a day. I'm not going to let him say that to me. And I pray you won't either. That you walk, that you'll, you'll consider the precious blood of Jesus Christ. You'll consider the fact you're going to have to stand before the one who will judge you impartially. And so that you'll conduct yourselves, your life here, your stay here, in fear. We can preach these unbelievers who are living in fornication and drunkenness, and who are living in dissipation. But are we preaching them to ourselves? And examining ourselves fully about these things? And allowing God, I mean, there's some things we, we saw this morning that we're not aware of sometimes. But God can make us aware of these things. But if we're not listening to a still small voice, how are we going to hear him? In Psalm 39, David pray, prayed this to the Lord. He said in verse 4 of Psalm 39, Lord, make me to know my end. Make me to know my end. Is he asking God to reveal to him the exact day he's going to die? No, he goes on. And what is the measure of my days? That may know how frail I am. Indeed, you have made my days as handbreadths, and my age is as nothing before you. Certainly, every man has best days but vapor. That should be our prayer, friends. Lord, make me to know my end. Let my end be good. Let me let me use the what I have right now so that my end will be good. Let, let me see how small my space of time is. You know, I know we've talked about prioritizing our lives in this fellowship, and I think it's something that a, a Christian should be thinking about at all times. But I don't know, friends. I just I think we need to go further. And we're going. I'm preaching this to myself too. We need to go further, and we're going. Psalm 90, verse 10. The days of our lives are seventy years, and if by reason of strength they are eighty years, yet their boast is only in labor and sorrow, for it's soon cut off and we fly away. Soon cut off and we fly away. I can't even imagine eighty years. I'm thirty three. I, I can't even imagine eighty. I can't imagine fifty. But it's gonna fly away. It's gonna fly away. Talk to anyone in this fellowship is older than you, it'll fly away. Seemed like my, my high school was just yesterday. It'll fly away. And verse 12 gives us the answer to this. So teach us to number our days. That we may gain a heart of wisdom. We need to number our days, friends. You know, it, it, it could be true that I'm closer to death than someone who's older than me right here in this fellowship. It could be true that a 15-year-old is closer to death than a 50-year-old. So we all need to number our days. Don't think to yourself, well, I'll live to be good and old. Don't think that to yourself. Christ may return. 
Praise God if he does. But we need to number our days. We need to count them and use them properly and think about them and pay attention to them and not let them escape us. You know, Christ redeemed us. Not so we can be free to do whatever we want to do. But he made us change us from being a slave to sin to being a slave to righteousness. And so when we redeem the time, we're no longer its slave. It is now our slave. It is now our slave. And we are the master over it. And then in Ephesians 4, verse 27, just one little small verse here. Just, just six words. It's so important. So important. And right before this is talking about being angry and not sinning and not letting the sun go down in your anger. But this last part in verse 27 applies to everything in life. Nor give place to the devil. Nor giving opportunity to the devil. I'm not just talking about these other things that, that we talk to lost sinners about, but you know, wasting your time is an opportunity for the devil. He wants you to waste your time. He wants you to not walk circumspectly. Instead of redeeming the time and taking it captive and, and using it and having it be your slave, you could be its slave. And so we need to be careful, looking around, walking carefully, not giving place to the devil. Because the enemy, one of the greatest enemies of the best, is the good. Because people settle for it. And they think, I'm doing better than this person. I'm not a lost sinner. I'm living for Jesus Christ. I'm not doing this, that, this, and that. But are you redeeming the time? Or are you wasting the time? You know, there was an argument recently. I posted something similar to this on, on, on Facebook. I, I, I really couldn't believe what was coming out of people's mouths. And oftentimes, when when you when you prick someone's heart about a sin in their life, their automatic response to that is trying to justify that by finding some kind of sin in their life. And and, and you tell someone, well, "Don't waste your time. Don't waste your time with football. Don't waste your time with with these things that are going to drown out what you really should be doing." And I say, "Well, you you waste time, don't you? You do this, that, this, and that, don't you?" And and well, the question is, could you say no to them? Can you say no to them? I'm not wasting my time. That's what it's about, right? We're talking about. So may, may, may we really be able to say what we sung this morning. That he, we, we're keeping our eyes on him. That it is all about him. That, that, uh, that we do have one pure and holy passion. One magnificent obsession. To run. Not to walk. Not to crawl, but to run and follow. Not easy, but hard after him. So what say you, friends? Examine your life. Examine your heart. Examine your time. Look carefully back at it. Well, what did I do here? Well, what, how many hours did I waste there on the computer? How many hours did I waste here about with foolishness that doesn't make doesn't make anything in light of eternity? You know, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, friends, I get so many emails from so many people and about spiritual things. These are good things to answer. But God forbid I stand before God and I paid more attention to these people than I did to my own family. God forbid. They should mean... I know they're my responsibility. But it's not a responsibility of any of us to be a Bible answer man to everybody. But we know that our family is our responsibility. And so these, even the good things, answering someone's questions about the Bible, debating about theology of someone who's sitting in darkness, come become the enemy of the most excellent things that you know God wants you to be involved in. Paying attention to your spouse, paying attention to your children, and doing what you know He wants you to do.
May the world become empty, pale, and poor. So, compared to knowing Him. discussion if anyone wants to add anything to this or to <laughs> add scriptures or questions. Something that goes right along and I don't know where it's referenced that other than when Paul's talking to Timothy the Rent Race. Anybody who's ever been in track before or or rent a race with a friend, mm -hmm. uh, you don't sit there and talk. Oh. So, your friend runs off, but your friend can be timed. Mm -hmm. you, you chase after him, chase in front of him. Yeah, it's 1 Corinthians 9 24. And Paul even said in the end of it, he said, I knew I did it well. Mm -hmm. Like, you know what you know. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. The one who competes for the prize is tempered in all things, self controlled in all things. Mm -hmm. They do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty, thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should also become disqualified. That sums it up, friends. These people who are in, I mean, if we went to the Super Bowl this weekend, or preached before it, these men put their whole life into this game. They train, they change their diet, they change their workout, they give up their families. You know, some people retire from sport because, oh, I haven't seen my child in 15 years. They give up everything, they put everything on this altar, and they do it for millions of dollars. And they're only doing it for a perishable crown, for a Vince Lombardi piece of gold, with moth and rust will destroy. Mm -hmm. But can we say that we run as hard after Jesus as they do after Vince Lombardi trophy? Can we say we run as hard after Jesus as they do? They skate for the Stanley Cup. I mean, they're in sin for doing this. They're in idolatry. But can we put them to shame? As Paul is saying, he puts those Olympians to shame because they're, they, they didn't get they didn't get gold back. They didn't get gold medals. They got a actual crown of leaves, which actually did leaves wither away. They get them brown. Bugs eat them. And they go back in the ground, and all they're good for is, is feed for the garden. But the crown we receive is not going to perish. Can, can we put them to shame? Do we run as hard after them, at, at Jesus, as they do after these, these silly little crowns, which are going to perish? I got uh, a couple of verses that came to mind while you were preaching. It was in Luke uh, chapter 10, uh, verses 41 and 42. Um, I hope it's okay. I'm reading from the King James. That's fine. Yeah. It says, And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. But one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part which she which shall not be taken away from her. So that's what we need to do is we need to stop being like Martha and going after these good things, these things that are good. Uh, we need to be like Mary. Uh, we need to find that, that best thing, that good part that shall not be taken away from us. That's what we really need to go after. So that's just what, what just really spoke out aloud yes. to me yeah. when you are preaching. She was, she was serving Jesus' food. Food's important. We need to provide for our families and cook our families' meals. Uh, we need to, to work to provide for our families. Those things are important. But Martha was, Nicodemus is worried and troubled about many things. But one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen the good thing. Very good, boy. Thank you for sharing that. Yes. But then, in the upper room, there's only 120. 